All right, well, welcome to the first ever official episode of the official Cyblogs podcast. My name is Elf Eldridge. I'm Amy Woodcroft. And we're here to present you some of the most delicious science articles of the last seven days. The uh, podcast will generally be 20 to 30 minutes long, and it'll be a mixture of sort of short bits and pieces pointing you to uh, interesting articles or, or bits of science that we've come across. Sometimes we will interview fellow sci-bloggers or, or other science people about um, in- issues that come up. It's pretty free form. So uh, we'll dive straight in then. Um, The first uh, article of the week, in fact, is about two New Zealanders who are now living overseas. Um, And uh, their names, sorry, rather, are Dan Knox and Ryan Abbott and Elizabeth Ions. Elizabeth Ions and Dan Knox are the Kiwis. And they've started something called Science Exchange um, overseas in the States. And it basically allows researchers to outsource pieces of research that they may not have the time or equipment or expertise to do to people who do, Um, in the same way that IT uses outsourcing to cut down costs and to sort of let people who can do a better job of it do exactly that. Um, That's what this will do. They've got a whole bunch of uh, major universities already signed up uh, to do it, including Princeton, Duke, Stanford, and Johns Hopkins. Um, They've raised a fair bunch of money so far. They're looking to raise a little bit more, but it's, uh, it's potentially a very interesting idea, and it's certainly something that people have been talking about for quite some time now, either in terms of work to be done or sometimes just outsourcing problems to other brains. It's very, very cool. Do you know where they're based? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Ah, she, well, certainly Elizabeth Irons is an EMBA student at MIT Sloan. Um, oh, cool. Fantastic. Mm. Yet more awesome work that's coming out of that place. Yeah, indeed. So jealous. Okay, well, uh, the next article on our list is from me, and we can't this week have gone past mentioning the um, Rutherford uh, Fellowships. Uh, These are a series of postdoctoral fellowships that fund early-stage career researchers for five years, I think it is. They get a significant chunk of money to go towards them and towards their research, and they're really, really good, but they only get awarded to essentially the best of the best. And the ten best from this week, I'm going to mention them by name, so tough if you don't find it interesting. Um, Dr. Quentin Atkinson from University of Auckland, Nancy Bertler from GNS Science, Peter Finneran from University of Otago, David Goldstone from University of Auckland, Christopher Han, University of Canterbury, Justin Hodgkiss, yay, Victoria University of Wellington, uh, Nicole Moreham from Victoria University of Wellington as well, v- uh, Wayne Patrick from Massey, Anthony Poole from Canterbury, and Nick Shears from University of Auckland. Um, Awesome new scientists doing some really groundbreaking research right here in New Zealand, and it's great to see them being supported uh, by the government and by Royal Society. Mm, Indeed. Um, If you're interested in knowing more about the uh, work that they're doing, pop onto the blog post um, on Cyblogs that comes with this podcast. There we will have links to every article that we mention and that we talk about um, in each episode, as well as links to other interesting things that we didn't have the time to talk about, but we nonetheless thought you guys might enjoy listening to. Yeah, there are always heaps that we don't have time to talk about, and the link is actually just called Other Interesting Things. Yeah, exactly. Um, Right, next one is... This comes out of science, uh, Scientific American, rather. It was originally published in Nature, possibly. Um, and it's all about scientists, particularly who uh, work on Venus, who perceive uh, an increasing bias against Venus-type research from NASA. Now, what's happened is it, Venus is a fascinating, fascinating planet to study um, because Whoa. of the <laughs> the extremely hardcore atmospheric and environmental processes that are going on there. It's hot enough to melt lead. Um, it's pretty It's pretty unpleasant down there. But very interesting to, un, uh, to study, particularly because of the runaway, uh, the runaway greenhouse effect that, that stripped the uh, planet bare of pretty much everything other than nastiness. It's essentially a warning sign for us here on the Earth, right? Pretty much. And so scientists are very, easy, are very interested in studying it, um, but there is less and less money to do so, and most of the uh, missions that get proposed are shut down. They are never approved. And the reason for that is it's a positive feedback loop. Um, The fewer scientists there are working on Venus, the less fantastic the proposals are going to be, so the less money they're going to get, also the less students want to become involved in Venus research. And this just goes round and round as the pool dwindles. Uh, There are hopes that this will come right in the next couple of years, uh, particularly wanting to to look at this runaway uh, greenhouse effect and exactly sort of what happened there. So we'll have to see what happens, but 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 there's uh, some interesting moaning going on about why are we ignoring Venus? 
And I mean, we've only just started to appreciate it. We've only got uh, radio images of its surface because its surface is completely covered in clouds yeah. of uh, clouds of carbon dioxide. It rains sulfuric acid. It's yeah. 500 degrees. Um, really, really interesting place. But I guess when you're comparing it to things like Saturn and Jupiter, which are yeah. bigger targets to hit. <laughs> At the moment, and and there's the cost of of probes don't last very long once they're down there a couple of hours maybe <laughs> before they're taken out by by the prevailing conditions. Yeah. So while there are very good reasons to to be studying it, it it certainly seems like there is some kind of bias going on that that is is being fought against quite loudly. Which is a shame, considering it's the closest planet to Earth as mm, well. Indeed. Oh, um, next thing on the list is also uh, astronomy related. Um, it's a article we picked up from New Scientist, and it's essentially NASA being slightly worried about the supply of astronauts. Mm. They're worried that there's not going to be enough astronauts to sustain a permanent space program in the future. This is from the same people that have just scrapped the space shuttle missions, yeah. and they are planning on um, keeping American astronauts up in space up until 2020 using the International Space station. Um, but they're worried that because of the detrimental health effects long-term stays in space have on the human body, it can screw with your vision, it can um, it makes your bones less dense, it has a whole bunch of uh, quite negative effects. You can't leave people up there for a long time, so you need more astronauts. And they're really, really worried about uh, what impact this will have on the future of the space program worldwide, not just the American one. I must say, I find that quite funny. Uh, the well, from what I read, the articles I read, there are so many people out there who say, I would love to have been an astronaut, but there doesn't seem to be any work in it, particularly with NASA snowballing most of the big projects. So if they're worried about uh, sourcing astronauts, perhaps they just need to be clear that there will be work for astronauts should they decide to become one. Well, i got to be honest, if I was planning a future career, I wouldn't go for astronaut because I'm seeing funding cut after funding cut after funding cut after funding cut. Exactly. I'm like, what, what? point do they reach when they start cutting life support to the space station <laughs> it's just there's there's some levels there's a line where you should not yeah. cross the funding cut I, exactly I'd, I'd take some bone density loss to go up into space this would not be such an issue oh. yeah, was a, there's a great interview online with a guy that says poses the question right if you're looking for volunteers to mars who would go and he said there'd be people lined up around around the block even exactly. if there was no return trip yeah i, I know i would I'd, I'd be pushing people over to get to the front whatever it took i know people who would be pushing me to the front <laughs> get off this planet <laughs> well there's that too <laughs> um the next one is just a couple of uh, beautiful images that have cropped up this week um and interesting infographics oh yeah now the first is the most unbelievably beautiful picture of Saturn. Now we love Saturn because of her rings, and and she's just gorgeous generally. He, sorry, I I, I think <laughs> of planets like I think of cars and boats for some reason. There there she's. I I realize that may not be correct. This was taken. This the the picture. I apologize. The picture in question was taken in 2006 when um, the Cassini Huygens mission was doing its marvelous thing and taking photos of Saturn and its moons. And um, so this was taken by that mission. It's difficult to describe it, but do have a look at the link. It, it makes it look completely fake. It doesn't look like a photograph at all. It looks like a slightly cheesy c uh, CG artist's rendition. But beautiful nonetheless. It does look like a complete artist's <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> it does. It's hilarious. The next one, those of you who read stuff or, or the local newspapers may have seen this, um, some decent high-def images have been taken of the moon. And you can actually see now uh, the NASA's lunar, well, sorry, what took it was the NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter image, uh, imaging device. Um, and they're looking at the Apollo 12 landing site. And you can see all the tracks from where people were and the various bits where they landed or, you know, hit golf balls. Or yeah. you can even see some of the um, rubbish that they left behind. That that has caused some interesting Debris. discussion. Debris, not, yeah. not rubbish. Exactly. <laughs> it's not trash like we think of trash. It's stuff that... There was no point in bringing back. This is artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, but they are quite beautiful. And it's it's also interesting to see, you know, everybody who believes that the moon landings, for example, happened going, ha, what do the Danaiers have to say to this? And, of course, the Danaiers are saying other stuff. And it, there's lots of fun back chat on the Internet about this. Yeah, clearly. I mean, if you look at the images, they look exactly like worm tracks and mud. That's the first thing that I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's got to be what it is. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the moon mud worms. It's, it's an ant farm. Okay. Uh, next one is an infographic developed by Cisco. It's called the Internet of Things. It's also done the rounds this last week. And they're just talking about the increasing uh, use of, of the Internet by devices, and it's not just your iPad or your smartphone or your computer. It's the fact that people are now attaching sensors to cows 
and they send in data. And so all of these devices that we use, not, are they, not only are they hooked up to the internet, but they're sending in reams and reams and reams of data. And this is increasing absolutely hugely. Um, the stat, I haven't checked it, but this is what the infographic says, is that by the end of 2011, 20 typical houses will generate more, inter -traffic, uh, more internet traffic than the entire internet did in 2008. So it's going to be fascinating to watch what happens. Um, <laughs> we shall see. Hopefully everything can handle it. Uh, yeah. That's it will. There's business opportunities if it doesn't. That's the wonderful thing about the market. It's kind of self-correcting. This right? is true. And that's why everyone's gone so over to the IPv6 protocol because that basically means there are enough IP addresses now to handle all these billions, basically, of devices, including tiny little cameras and things that, that are sending in um, data. Of course, processing that is a different matter. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's important that we process all of that cow data. It's... Crucial. Well, kind of. Actually, it would be really <laughs> interesting for agricultural uses here. Uh, I imagine a lot of farmers may start using that because you can pick up things like the health, health of the cow, where it is, how it's doing, um, particularly with uh, some of the, the more intensive farming practices. It could be very, very useful. Yeah. Well, it should be very, very useful. Mm. Um, sometimes should and is uh, quite different things. Yeah, I'm not sure that cows tweeting is potentially a valid use of data, but it is funny, and right. it does happen. And judging by some of the things I've seen off Twitter, a bit of general <laughs> grammatical improvement, I think. <laughs> Probably. 